week on Diplomatic Channel. The U.S. withdraws from yet another nuclear deal, this time with Russia, as the international community warns of the impact. The journey to shared civilian rule continues in Sudan as the military and the opposition agree on constitutional declaration. Plus, 10 years since the Boko Haram attack began in Nigeria, the UN discusses the impact, solutions and lessons from the conflict. That's Diplomatic Channel in a wrap. Let's begin with a quick check on other discussions in diplomatic circles. I am Amarachi Ubani. Welcome to the program. Iran's state media has reported the country's revolutionary guards have seized a foreign oil tanker that was smuggling fuel and detained seven crewmen. Footage broadcast on the state TV showed what the narrator described as smuggled fuel being stored aboard the confiscated tanker. The vessel was intercepted near the country's Farsi island in the Gulf. The elite Revolutionary Guard Corps has a Navy base on the island, which is located north of the Strait of Ormuz. The vessel was carrying 700,000 litres of fuel. Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan says his country will carry out an operation east of the Euphrates River in northern Syria in an area controlled by the Kurdish YPG militia. Turkey has been running out of patience with the United States, which made an agreement with Ankara to implement a safe zone in northeastern Syria. The president says both Russia and the United States have been told of the operation. Following President Donald Trump's announcement last year, of a planned U.S. withdrawal from northern Syria, the NATO allies agreed to create a safe zone inside Syria along its northeastern border with Turkey that will be cleared of the YPG militia. The YPG was Washington's main ally on the ground in Syria during the battle against the Islamic State, but Turkey sees it as a terrorist organization. Justice of the Peace in the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, Gu Ming Kang, says protesters that have committed violence and law-breaking acts during the recent demonstrations in the city should receive punishment according to law. Mr. Gu made the announcement in an interview with the Chinese news network. He stressed that as some protesters have violently charged police stations, vandalized vehicles and set fire in various places in weeks of mass demonstrations, Hong Kong supports peaceful protests only and that people violating the law should always be punished. Hong Kong traditionally protect peaceful demonstration, and this is the way to show uh, democracy is uh, fully realized in Hong Kong in the past. Uh, however, recently, we see more and more demonstration become more violent, and those violent protests uh, against the law in various aspects. For example, crime of riots, crime of arson, crime of destroying public and private properties, crime of occupying offensive weapons, and so on. And those crimes will be investigated. If those persons being arrested, they will be prosecuted and be maybe given serious uh, punishment. Last week marked 10 years since the death of a founder of Boko Haram, Mohamed Yesufu, and the beginning of the group's deadly assault on innocent Nigerians. Figures vary on the number of people killed since that time, but many have pegged the start of the group's activities, violent activities that is, to when the group's first leader was allegedly killed while in police custody in 2009. Today we remember friends, families, colleagues, and soldiers who have paid the ultimate price as victims of the group's attacks. You also remember those still in the group's captivity and pray for their well-being and welfare and rescue and acknowledge and commend the fight put up by the Nigerian military forces against insurgency in the country. You also urge them to do more. Now, believe it or not, the international community has been affected by the insurgency in Nigeria. August 26, 2011 will always be a dark day in the history of the United Nations. Its building in the federal capital territory Abuja was hit by a car bomb, the impact of which killed at least 21 people and wounded 60 others. It was devastating to the international body. The Nigerian government stepped in, promising to have the building renovated within six months. Well, eight years later, 
you and staff were only finally able to return. It is in this renovated structure that my colleague Kayla Megwa had a conversation with the UN Resident Humanitarian Coordinator for Nigeria, Mr. Edward Callum. Take a listen. What's so significant about this year's World Humanitarian Day? I mean, it's, 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 a good, it's a good day for all of us, but a very sad one for us today because we are commemorating 10 years of the crisis in Northeast Nigeria, which means that the crisis is protracted and a call to find a durable solution to this crisis. This particular office was hit in 2011. 18 people lost their lives when that car bomb exploded here. How has the UN been handling that particular tragic situation? It has been a traumatic experience for the United Nations colleagues, you know, and we are also extremely, extremely um, uh, disturbed by the impact that incident had on families and our colleagues. When we were about to move to this building after this generous, generous um, contribution by the government of Nigeria, I mean, we actually have to work on some psychosocial support for some of our staff, I mean, I mean to make sure that, I mean, we prepare them coming back to this building. But I want to also hasten to really extend my sincere thanks to the government of Nigeria for the investment they have made in rehabilitating and actually modernizing this iconic um, UN um, uh, house in, uh, in, in this country. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. As you can see in my office, if there, if there is one place I can think, this is the place. And since I came in back here, I can tell you that my productivity has improved because I work in an environment with the serenity I required, which enables me to, to, be, to be focused in what I am doing. So it is indeed um, a laudable investment. And an investment also that points out that terrorists cannot have their way. Yeah, so that is, those are some of the good moments when we reflect on it, that we can together defeat terrorism. One of the, the impacts of the, of the terrorist attack on the UN building here was that it strengthened our resolve, you know, our resolve that we have to stand with this affected population. And that's exactly what we have been doing. The situation um, um, is still not the best, I mean, to be, to be very frank about it. We are talking about 6.2 million people that still need humanitarian assistance that we are trying to reach in 2019. We are talking about 1.8 million people that are still displaced in, uh, in, in, in IDP camps in uh, Bono, Adamawa, and Yobe. But the window of hope is that about 1.6 million people have started returning back to their homes. But these people need a lot of support because they are returning to communities with no basic social services. And that is why I'm extremely, extremely happy with the establishment of the Northeast Development Commission that we'll be looking at these issues critically and providing the required support for people to start rebuilding their lives and livelihood together with the state authorities and the federal government. So it's a good start in the right direction. But yet still, the humanitarian needs are still high. In 2018, we, re we, we, we required about $848 million to provide assistance to 6.2 million people. My hope is that these needs will re reduce why development needs will increase. Because the solution to this crisis in Northeast Nigeria is peace. And that means we should be able to address the root causes of this crisis, which include development deficit over a very long period of time, poverty that is now multidimensional, governance and, um, um, and the human rights concerns that we have, and also um, uh, um, uh, climate vulnerabilities that is compounding the impact of this crisis. So it is so critical that that investment is done uh, so that people can start rebuilding their lives. My focus and, and, and strategy has always been to try to build the humanitarian assistance around, um, uh, through, uh, around a resilience-based approach. What I mean by that is to try to get people to cope with the impact of the crisis, recover from it, and engage in transformative change. So that is the strategic focus of our assistance. But as you pretty well know, we are talking about a large scale of, 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 of people that are affected and a large scale of needs. Are these places even safe enough at this point in time for people to be going back to? In parts of Yobi and Adamawa, the situation is relatively safe. 
and people have started returning back to their homes. That doesn't mean that the whole state is completely safe. You still have um, uh, pockets, of in, in pockets of areas that are insecure. But a vast um, uh, part of, the, of those two states, um, uh, people have started returning. And all, even in Bono, which has still a large number of people in displaced camps, there are areas where people are returning and where some recovery and early, early recovery activities are taking place. The, the estimate we have is that close to 1.6 million people have started returning to safe, relatively safe areas in the, in the three states. When it comes to internally displaced persons in northeast Nigeria, how would you assess the amount of aid that has been given and is it getting better? Are they going to be able to have functional lives after this tragic situation that they faced? I can tell you for one that um, the response in 2017 actually averted the famine in northeast Nigeria. We were able to provide assistance to 5.6 million people and that assistance included food, water, sanitation, health services, etc. together with the government. You know, without those critical assistance, uh, I mean, people were going, to, um, uh, were going to lose a lot of lives. But thank God that does not happen. We were also able to contain uh, cholera outbreaks and other disease outbreaks that were, that were very, very critical for the, for the affected population that we are living in camps. So in no doubt, we were able to, 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 to sustain lives in the short term. But that is not a solution to the crisis. Yeah, we have to find a solution to this crisis, and that means people being able to go back to their homes yeah, and to start rebuilding their lives and livelihoods. My call on the government has always been trying to look at uh, opportunities for dialogue and a political process to complement the military effort to find a solution to this crisis, which is very, very critical. And I'm, I also keep on calling on all stakeholders to invest in addressing the root causes of this crisis. And these root causes include development deficit, as I've already outlined to you. I mean, issues of climate vulnerabilities are compounding the problems, and not to talk about poverty that is now really multidimensional, including the deficit, the human, the governance and human rights deficit issues that we have to deal with in the affected states. I think these stories are important to remind us that uh, we should not uh, sit idle and, and allow this unnecessary human suffering to continue for, 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 for too long. We're talking about 10 years of the crisis, which means it is protracted, which means we must look at both humanitarian and development assistance to address the impact of this crisis. So this is a call to all stakeholders today that we are dealing with a protracted crisis and that we need to work together to find a durable solution to this crisis. We must work towards peace in Northeast Nigeria. And that is basic if we are going to talk about um, uh, uh, the search of durable solutions. The experience it will give those who have opportunity to, to, to see the virtual reality is the symbolic impact this conflict is having on the lives of people, especially women and children. I mean, that is what this exhibition is going to demonstrate. Why should we allow this level of suffering? Why should we allow women and children to, 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 um, to undergo such a suffering. We have civilians are still bearing the brunt of the crisis. And this is a crisis that has violated, to a very, very large extent, uh, existing international humanitarian and human rights law. So it is unacceptable to allow this level of suffering. So my hope is that when Nigerians we see this virtual reality, they will be touched and everybody can do whatever they can in their own small capacity to work towards the search of a durable solution. What are some of the major things that have stood out for you as you've covered this conflict? That the level of human suffering is unacceptable. Yeah? And that uh, the crisis is having disproportionate impact on women and children. Yeah? And also, I see a population that has lost everything. A population that has no hope left for them. I'm also touched that people's lives have been put in such a disarray. There are communities uprooted, and then people living on bare, bare, basic, basic assistance. I think there is an African virtue that we always have to believe, that however poor you are, but if you are in a safe environment, you can be able to earn a living. We are talking about a population that's not able to earn a living. 
a population that is dependent on humanitarian aid. This is unacceptable. And that is why I think that we must, the, the government and all interested stakeholders must continue to work very hard to find a solution to this crisis. The situation we are seeing in Northeast Nigeria is unacceptable. When we come back after the break, with the U.S. pulling out of the intimidate range nuclear forces treaty with Russia, what next? Please stay with us.